So hi, thank you all for coming after lunch on the second day. I'm very happy to have you today. So thank you for coming for my presentation, Checkmate Using Game Theory to Study the Evolution of Ransomware. Uh, this is going to be a presentation about my preliminary results from my doctoral research. So. Okay, why is this not? Okay, perfect. So who am I? Well, I mean, Masara described me pretty well. Uh, I'm a PhD candidate full-time, but I also work at Itachi System Security full-time as a CTI analyst. Uh, I enjoyed reading a lot, uh, boxing way too much, and growing potatoes on my balcony. And above all, I'm also a crazy cat mom, so this is my little one. His name is Mr. Darcy, and he's pure evil. Don't get fooled by this face. So <laughs> uh, let's go over really quickly the presentation plan. Uh, so I'm going to introduce game theory really in simple terms, because otherwise I could spend three hours just on this. I'm going to discuss the reality of the cyber battles against ransomware, because this was something that I didn't anticipate until I started uh, in the industry, and that really impacted my research. Then I'll present the research methodology in the sample. Uh, because this is only a 30-minute talk, I'm only going to present certain results and analysis. I'll discuss the limits, because there is no research that is perfect. And then I'll conclude with some of the future steps that this research will take. So what is game theory? Game theory analyzes the interaction between self-interested groups who behave strategically to maximize their their, um, <clears throat> the probabilities of getting their end game. If we wanted to use this definition in terms of cybersecurity, what we could say is that we study the interaction between attackers and defenders in a way to predict the outcome of that interaction. However, for uh, this research, I'm not using game theory to predict behavior. I was warned uh, by my, my director and my supervisor that if I did, I'd fail automatically my thesis, and if you've done a thesis, you know, you don't want to fail for something so stupid. So <laughs> let's get back on topic here. So game theory is an economics theory which is often used in warfare or in conflict management, right? It's, you've probably heard of it on TV shows, but it gets usually very simplified and dumbed down. The only one show that I saw that did it pretty good was Prison Break Season 5, and even that was pretty simplified. Um, I did pick this theory when I thought it was cool, and now I'm regretting it every step of the way, but we're three years in and we're going with it, right? So <laughs> what uh, game theory brings is that you can look at how people behave, how they play together, and how they're gonna pick their strategies based on this interaction. So one way of doing this is you can look at what the person wants. What's their end game that they wanna take away from this, right? The reason they're in this game. So if we want to simplify this in, in, in um, cybersecurity, we can say that attackers want to make their attacks su successful, whereas defenders want to block all these attacks. So their behaviors are going to be, the choice of strategies is going to be according to their end game. So the only problem is that they can't both be winners and both can't be losers, right? So this is why we're, hope we're in a situation of zero-sum game which is defined as the, the win of one causes the direct loss of the other. So in cybersecurity, uh, for an attacker to win, the defender must have lost. You can't have half wins, right? You didn't just half-ass it. Whoops, I don't know if I'm allowed to say ass, but whatever. Um, you didn't halfway do it, you, you were successful. Uh, so I've talked a lot about definitions and you're probably thinking like, I really don't care about Econ 101, I skipped it for, for, for pints, so let's just bring it back to the main subject. So in ransomware, uh, the end game of the attack will be to launch that successful attack. And I'm going to stick on the technical side. I'm not going to focus on the extortion side today um, because 30 minutes. <laughs> uh, but so let's just say that for a successful ransomware to be, to be done, the, technically speaking, the threat actors need to be able to encrypt, corrupt, or steal the data. If not, the attack is not successful. So this is why we're in a zero-sum game, the cause of one. Uh, the win of one causes the direct loss of the other. So there are two types of game that I'm going to talk about today. There's the static and dynamic games. So static game is when the players are both acting at the same time, and so you have limited ways that you can prioritize strategies, right? You can think of rock, paper, scissors. Technically, there's only three strategies, but unless you've played with the person multiple times, you're limited in what the person is going to choose as a strategy. And again, there's only three. I feel like most people start with rock first, like that's just the easy one. 
So if you're thinking about this and you're like, okay, I should prioritize paper because then I'll win, but then everyone's thinking the same way. So then scissors technically becomes the main, the, the, the main strategy that would lead you to win. But if you haven't played this person before, you're still kind of guessing and you're, well, you have one third of a chance to be right. Dynamic games are different because it's more of in a sequence. So it's one after the other. You can think of a game of chess as being um, dynamic, right? So in a dynamic setting, you have more time to plan and more time to prioritize certain strategy over the other, and you see what the other are playing. Now, you take for granted that you both know the end game of the other, because we're playing chess. We're going to stick to the chess example for now. But there are two ways you can go about this if you want to win or make them lose, which in game theory, those are two different things, right? Depending on the type of settings you're in. So if player one does not want player two to win, player one can decide to take strategies that would block the other player or take strategies that will make them win. Um, so in a sequence, um, in a dynamic setting, you have a lot more opportunities to learn from your partner and dictate how you want to either maybe push them into a corner or make yourself get ahead of the game. See, when I first started this research, I thought cybersecurity was a clean cut dynamic setting. And uh, well, I was wrong. So let's figure out why I was wrong. So the reality of cyber battle, uh, I started this research over three years ago now. And when I did, I wasn't working in the industry. I wasn't at Itachi yet. And I got hit with a brick when I started working in the industry because the reality was so not the pink bubble that academia can be in research, right? I got like thrown into a war zone of just like, there are attacks everywhere, there's one defense team, this is not, the rules of engagements are just not there. So this became very complicated when you're trying to study this from a game perspective. So one of the main conclusions that I saw was it's not one game at once and it's also not one team against the other. It's more a bunch of different attackers team versus one team of defenders. So if we're going to take a sports metaphor, it's kind of like if the abs are playing against Toronto, Ottawa, Vegas, and Washington all at once on the same ice. Now, none of these teams are, represent the same level of threats, but you still kind of have to deal with them all. And yes, if you know the dig, you know the dig. That's all I'll say. So here's the problem with game theory with this in research is that it's very difficult to reconcile the fact that you're supposed to be one player against one player. And one player can be a team of players, by the way, just in case I, was, I didn't mention it. And then the other problem is that the weight of winning is no longer the same because the teams aren't the same. So for threat actor, for threat actor groups to win, they need to hit one place at the right time with the right tool or the right exploit or whatever to win. It's a little bit more complicated than that, but we'll simplify it for now. The problem is on the defender side, they must protect everything everywhere at all times. And that's just not the same weight because for those who work in the on the blue teams or defender side, you know that you always get surprised of things that you didn't know were connected on your attack surface. Like that random printer that's still admin admin from 10 years ago that they didn't put it on the sheet and you didn't know it existed until it was too late. I see some of you laughing because you know it happens, right? So now the thing is, we're in a situation where defenders are just set to lose at all times. And now, I didn't really like that and I decided to try to do something about it, which was kind of my downfall, but we'll talk about that. So story time, quick story. So in my family, we play this game called Pay Me, okay? We play every event for hours on end, and it's a dynamic setting card game. You either need to do series or, or identicals, right? But because I've played with the same family members over and over again, I kind of know what they do and their choices of strategies. So for example, my grandma, who's like the sweetest person ever, she counts cards. Like, I just know it, she does it. Uh, my brother loves risks, so he goes big at all times. He'll just, he, he's going all in. He's never won a game in like 10 years, but you know, he still, he still aims for that strategies. I do not like risk. I'm not someone who likes risks. So I, you know, play it easy and just cheat, but you know, maybe I do, maybe I don't, I probably do. So my point is because I play with them for years, I know how they behave and I know their strategies, right? So how, how about applying this logic to cybersecurity and learning the attacker's playbook? If you want to block attackers, you need to know how they might behave, right? 
Um, but then in, in cybersecurity research that applies game theory, one of the main downfalls is they're like, there's too many strategies, the number of strategies is infinite, and we can't do it. Well, yeah, okay, technically speaking, theoretically speaking, sure, yeah, but no, because we're all humans, right? You might, there might be an endlessly amount of possibilities, but humans don't know all of them. So you're already kind of hinting at something, right? Humans are rational, well, some of them are rational, not all of them. So I wanted to start looking at that playbook, but then look at, at it from an evolutionary perspective. But instead of focusing on everything that's changed, I wanted to look at what didn't. And the reason I wanted to do this was a few, before I started this research, I was reading this article that said that there are 20,000 new ransomware per quarter, right? And I'm pretty sure it was actually monthly, but let's just be conservative and say it was quarterly. And I remember thinking back then when I didn't really know anything about ransomware, well, compared to today and knew nothing about it, but I was like, there is no way in hell that there are 20,000 new strains that are created from scratch, right? Just didn't really make sense. And when I started uh, doing the data collection, I realized I was onto something, but back then I didn't know. So what I wanted to do was look at what hasn't changed and focus on this, because the idea was if it hasn't changed in, 50, in well, and got like the number of years that I was gonna study, then why would it change now? Why would it change next? And this is not, again, not in a prediction, it's more in a common sense situation, right? And then I wanted to know, well, if we can figure out what hasn't changed, can we put, prioritize countermeasures to these weak spots? Because then it might give us a chance to equal the, the weights of winning and losing. This was the idea. Uh, so this is the presentation of my doctoral studies. So the question was, how can game theory be applied to study the evolution of ransomware? And again, like I said, the research aim was to identify what hasn't changed in the techniques. The end game of this project will end up uh, while well, aiming to create an interactive kill chain using, um, well, not a kill chain, I'm not allowed to say that, sorry, an interactive kill tree using commonly used defense evasion techniques, which I'm not gonna have time to talk about today. Um, but today what I'm gonna focus on mostly is on discovery and defense evasion because it's what honestly interests me the most. So the methodology. So I gathered over uh, 400 white papers and the reason I use white papers to create this database was because I'm a criminologist and not, uh, so my malware analysis technique skills are non-existent. Uh, so I had to rely on the white papers. So what I did was I took those white papers and I applied the MITRE framework to them and tried to see if I could study evolution this way. Now, between you and I, this was the wrong call and I probably shouldn't have used the MITRE framework, but it was a well-established model that I knew was gonna be accepted for my thesis. Uh, but I'll explain to later on in the limits why that was probably not the right call. So what I did with those white papers is I collected not only the MITRE IDs, I collected also type of encryption they were using, um, their AKAs, all known, known as, their known associates and uh, particularities that they had. I'm not gonna have time to talk about all of this today, but I honestly, I kind of vacuumed it up and grabbed as much as I could and then played around with the data. So I ended up with a sample of 116 strings, uh, 51 were cryptoware, 65 were uh, leakware, and then I also redivided for future uh, testing the difference between ransomware, uh, ransomware as a service versus owned. The sample is from 2016 to 2020, well, I'm gonna say 2022 because I only have one uh, for 2023. I do, after NordSec, wanna go back and actually uh, add a little bit more, but I also need to graduate, so we'll see how that goes. But the original idea was actually a 15-year sample and um, I don't think I would have ever survived 15 years. I didn't have enough white papers. Um, and then I realized here that there's, I took some of you guys' white papers, so thank you so much for everyone who wrote one. I really appreciated it. Um, so the fun part, the reason we're all here, right? So let's talk about some results that I did. So I wanna talk briefly about initial access, right? Because it's the entry point. And this is something that's not gonna come as a surprise, but phishing remained the most used tactic for, technique for uh, initial access, and that was very stable per the six years that I was studying. So this is good news and a bad news, because the good news is, is because it, it, it requires an interaction, 
From a game theory perspective, it teases the idea that it can be stopped. And now, before we collectively roll our eyes, because I said phishing can be stopped, and we all know, most of us know that this is not that simple. Uh, I know, <laughs> I really know. Um, the idea is that game theory teases this. I don't know how realistic it is considering how stable this has been, but we can still continue to work on this. Uh, when phishing was not an option or wasn't used, um, vulnerability exploitation was the second one that was used the most. It's harder to do sometimes, but they're not dependent on users' behavior, so that made it a little bit simpler sometimes. I don't want to dwell on this too much because I only have half an hour, and honestly, I kind of want to geek out about other things than phishing. Not that there's anything wrong with it, it's just, it's phishing. I, li I like funny things better. So then I started focusing more on internal discovery. So when I first started gathering the data, I wasn't really doing any sort of analysis, right? I was just kind of gathering up and looking at it and, what did draw my attention to was discovery. So it probably shouldn't have surprised me as a CTI analyst, but back then I didn't know as much as I do now. But there was a lot of accents put on discovery, internal discovery. And it made sense later on because even though we all kind of know what's inside our infrastructure, we don't know where things are exactly. It's kind of like if you go rob a house, you kind of know that there's going to be, you know, certain money or pharmaceuticals and bathroom, but you don't know which bathroom and you don't know where the, the, the safe is. You have good idea that it's probably gonna be in the office, but do you really know where the office is from the outside? So this was kind of the same logic, right? And uh, as a CTI analyst, I got asked a lot of times like by clients that were just like, do you know what they took, right? I got ransom, they took, they encrypted everything, do you know what they took? And my answer was always the same. Whatever you're afraid that they took, that's what they took. The whole point of a ransomware, you have to make it hurt, right? If they didn't take, you know, what hurts the most or what you're most sometimes ashamed of, then it wouldn't really work. My point in all of this is that you need to know what's in your infrastructure. You need to know where things are and what's valuable to you because they will know it for you. Uh, we've seen an increase of ransomware groups that are tailoring their ransom demand to uh, their insurance policies because that increased their odds of payment. So they are looking, right? But what it also tells me was that, from a game theory perspective, is if internal discovery is really important to them, it can also be leveraged for defenders, right? So if you prioritize what you need to be, to be protected at all costs, right? And like I know we always say you need to protect everything, but let's be realistic, no one does but you need to know what the gold is. Like the, the pure jewels, you need to know what it is and how to protect it and put extra layer around those. And as a by the way, your employees' data falls under that category, please, for all of the employees. Um, so this is what you're gonna wanna do. The idea is if they're taking their sweet time with internal discovery, it gives you a chance to put a, like a trip wire or some sort to be able to protect yourself, or at least throw one Hail Mary to protect yourself. But I'm getting ahead of myself and I'll talk about this a little later. So this is from the sample, the discovery techniques that were most used in, that, uh, in the sample that I had. And as you can see that it's a lot of looking around of where things are, how to move around the infrastructure and looking for documents. So basically one of the main things that I saw was um, that they were also looking for certain files, extension files, right? They're looking for the Excel files in some Word document, and then the ones that includes things like Revenue 2022 that you know is gonna be on the OneDrive somewhere and it's gonna be shared across multiple people, you want that, right? They're gonna be looking for it. They're gonna be also looking at ways to travel within your infrastructure. So defense evasions, okay. So, Defense evasion was a big thing because I always thought it was the battleground of game theory, right? This is where the main interaction is, where you're testing your defense against your attack. And then turns out this is kind of where things went downhill for me. This is the distribution of defense evasion techniques in my sample. Uh, this sucked because I had too many strategies that weren't recurring. So when you're looking at something that isn't changing, Strategies that are once out of 116 is not good, because then you can't really draw any conclusion from this. So when this came out the first time, I, uh, 
Honestly, I was like, I think I'm going to have to change this project, and the pen testers in my life were right, and I can't do this. But then I didn't. I kept going, and then it turns out I was still right. But my point is, with something like this, you're kind of like, OK, so there's a lot of possibility of defense, defense evasion, but then why is there not more? So then I decided to do a cluster analysis. So a cluster analysis is grouping sets of objects in a way that they group the same people together that are more similar and different in different groups, I guess. One of the main problems I had is I had too many variables. So the first few times I, ran the, I tried running this, this test, uh, the software crashed twice. And then I realized the mistake was I had too many, so I had to cut down. And this is where things get tricky in, in research, is that you can just randomly select what data you want, because then that's just not fair, and you're playing with data, right? It's garbage in, garbage out. So what I had to do is think about it in a way, I'm like, OK, so if my goal is finding out what hasn't changed, then I need to pick the top 15 um, strategies that were most used. And as you can see, even when I did this, the model is still low or fair. It's still not great, because I had too many variables. Now, I could continue to play with it, but then that just wouldn't be ethical. And as much as I enjoy blurring the lines of hacking, this is not one of those times. So I got two clusters. I got two groups. My sample was divided in two. I, have, um, I got no time to evade at 56%, and 44% was catch me if you can. I work full time, and I do a PhD full time, so I find the fun where I can, which is naming stuff in names that I sh probably shouldn't. So let's look at them. Uh, let's look at uh, how they're, you know, the main particular use of each group. And what I found was it was pretty surprising because I had really thought that I was going to be facing groups with a lot more strategy, especially for the I got no time to evade. And this is a group at 56%, right? So it's most of my sample. Well, above average. Well, above half. And I kept thinking, why? Right? Why would I have a group with so the majority hasn't done much? And then it got me into thinking, there are, poss there, there are multiple possibilities for it. Uh, one of them is that th my framework is not working, that this, the, the um, techniques that they're using are so new or sophisticated that the MITRA didn't include them, which is a possibility. The second option was maybe they do such a good job at internal discovery that they know in advance what to avoid and don't need to use defense evasion techniques. Or they'll focus on basically what they really can. But because they took their time and mapping out and sniffing things, they didn't have to evade. The third option, and this is maybe more of the CT analyst speaking, but uh, this is the third option was, well, in order to evade, evade defenses, you need defenses in the first place. So maybe the victims didn't have any countermeasures in place, and therefore they didn't need to avoid evade much defenses. The second group, which is the smaller one, the catch me if you can, had their hands in multiple types of strategies a little bit everywhere, right? So I, for them, I, I, I kind of got the idea that it, they were a little bit more teasing, just going, doing a little bit of everything at once. Whereas I got no time to evade, really focus on hiding their code and their presence in their code. So I got more of a weasel kind of type for them because the devil is in the details. And if you're not, if the defense is not looking in the logs for any small little, you know, abnormalities, they would probably miss it. So this is what I got from this. The common strategies. So this was what both groups had in common, and it was a lot. Like, they both had these strategies multiple times at a higher rate, I guess. And so that's why I wanted to talk about them. So what I saw from this is that the core real defense evasion laid a lot on avoiding sandbox, so sandbox evasion, and modifying, uh, well, disable or modifying the firewall. So these were more defense evasions that were more, per, like, direct to the evading defenses, whereas the others, even though they're considered defense evasion, were a little bit more on like trying to set yourself up for your next step, right? So they're looking at ways to move around for lateral movement, persistence, and uh, elevation of privileges, which I thought was interesting because when I thought of defense evasion, I really thought it was attacking the defenses, but then turns out it was also just by kind of weaseling out of them too. So time flies when we're having fun, so I'm going to keep this short. So this is where I, I kind of am. Um, I forgot to mention, 
two weeks ago, my partner dropped his coffee all over my laptop and I lost four, four months of research. And so I had to restart everything in the last two weeks. So this is the result of this. So this is why uh, some of the results are not uh, as pushed as I had intended it to be because I didn't have time to finish. So the attacker's playbook. So I know I've been quick on the results, but honestly, I can really geek out about this for hours. So I'll be around today and tomorrow. So if you have more thoughts or questions or anything, I'll be very happy to geek out about this more. So let's go with the short conclusion on this. So in an ideal world, we'd focus on threat actors just not getting initial access, right? In an ideal world, we would all have such strong walls that nothing could get in. But honestly, that's just not the reality. And like, sure, we could you know, increase the security around emails, Teams, Slack, LinkedIn, and all of this. It would help, but I don't think it would stop anything. So I rather focus on limiting damages and making the job of hacking harder than it has to be, because then a lot of threat actors are just going to be like, eh, whatever, I'm not, gonna do I'm not wasting my time on this, right? So that brings me back to discovery and defense evasion. So what I learned is that the importance of discovery, even though it's logical, defense could use this to their advantage. Because threat actors may know what they want to find, but they don't know exactly where it is, right? And this is where you can mess with them. So you can make that job a lot harder, longer, and with more traps. So in criminology, we suspect that the longer the crime takes to be committed, the more chances of natural, well, not natural selection, but of natural ways to be stopped, right? Uh, you have more chances of getting caught, more chances of something going wrong. So why not apply this to the discovery stage, right? Fool them, make traps, and traps that can give you enough time to protect the jewels. So I was um, talking to one of my favorite uh, pen testers of all time, Adrian, who's right here today, and I was asking him about honeypots, because I know honeypots are, you can see them from miles away. So I wanted to, what's the alternative, right? Modern day alternative. And he was talking to me about putting vulnerable uh, switch devices in pre-selected spot in order to use them to raise an alarm that would give you enough time to protect the jewels. Um, I watched an I listened to an episode of Darknet Diaries two days after that conversation, and that product was already out there, so I guess I was onto something. So the limits of this paper. I'm limited by what was in the white papers. Uh, so if I didn't have enough information, I kind of disregarded um, the strain because I couldn't do much with it. I, am, I was limited on that side. Ransomware are customizable, and they do change depending on their target. So I need to be clear that it's 116 strains that were seen at least once. But it doesn't mean that I got the full, I don't know, like Lockbit 3's full MO, right? Because they changed with their targets. So the result cannot be fully generalized. But it is telling us at least some trends that should not you know, be ignored either. The Mitra framework is great. But when you're trying to analyze it for evolution, the newer papers included a lot of like strategies that were not in the Mitra framework that I had to add in myself, uh, which then became kind of a problem. So the next step is to continue to analyze the strategies against the years, but this time I'm going to do it from a qualitative perspective because uh, based on stats, there wasn't that much difference and it was hard to handle. So again, devil's in the details, right? Then I'm going to be mapping out the strategies in a kill tree, and then, but only focus on defense evasion. And I might actually include discovery yet, but I haven't talked to my supervisor about it. And then the final step is, yeah, I got to write the paper. I got to write the dissertation and defend it. So hopefully by uh, next May, I will have something uh, done. But life, you know. So on this, I want to thank you all for coming to my talk. And this is, well, if you want to reach me, if you want to talk to me, I'll be around. Uh, I'm volunteering tonight and tomorrow. And this is my best friend, Kevin, for those who don't like cats. So I put a dog at the end to make sure that you would have someone. He's living his best life in Scotland, and he is thriving. So I thought you would enjoy a dog at the end of this kind of grim presentation, even though there was a lot of pink. <laughs> so thank you so much for your time. <laughs>